Professor Arun Sundarajan is the leading scholar in the world on the topic of the share economy. <laughs> Professor. Thank you, Scott. I live in New York City. I don't own a car, but sometimes I want a car. How many of you own cars? How many of you have owned a car in the last year? How many of you sold your car before you moved to New York City? Yeah, so I don't own a car either, right? It doesn't make sense, but sometimes I want a car. Sometimes I want to use a car. And you know, I walk down the street and I see all these cars sort of sitting on the street and they're parked there for hours on end. And I say to myself, it would be really nice if I could just pick up one of these cars, <laughs> drive it around for a couple of hours and return it to its parking spot, maybe leave a 20 on the dashboard with a note that says, thank you. <laughs> but the idea I'm gonna to talk to you about is actually making that reality, that idea, that you don't have to own stuff in order to use it. And people are calling it collaborative consumption, the sharing economy. Let me tell you what it's about. Fundamentally, we are creating, or like, you know, a bunch of companies are creating internet-based marketplaces that allow people to use each other's stuff and to sort of consume stuff that they don't own, but which they share with a sort of like a loosely defined community of people. So when I say that to you, you might say, well, internet-enabled marketplace to sort of get other people's stuff. We've already seen that 10 years ago. Like, you know, keep your eyes to this side of the screen. That's, 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 the part I, that's the part I want you to focus on. But the marketplaces that are emerging today, and there are a whole host of sharing economy platforms that are exploding, they are going sort of so far beyond. They're, they're in the same verticals that Craigslist is in, but there are specialized marketplaces in these verticals that are making shared consumption a reality. Here's the basic idea. For the last 50 or 60 years, our model of consumption has been individual. We choose what we want, sort of influenced in part by advertising. If we want something, we have to go out and buy it and own it in order to use it. And our access to the stuff that we want is governed by how much money we have or how much credit we can get. Okay, so that's individual consumption. In this world of collaborative consumption that certain verticals are moving towards, the idea is that what you want is governed not by advertising, but by like, you know, what you hear about from your community. Not necessarily your specific neighborhood, but your internet-enabled community. Rather than owning assets, you will have shared access to things. So like, you know, the same asset is sort of accessed by a number of different people. And your access to it is governed not by your credit, but by your reputation. How well have you used this shared asset? Now, as this transition occurs, and we go from individual to collaborative consumption, the way production is organized will start to move from within corporations that employ tens of thousands of people to platforms that employ maybe like a handful of people, but are fundamentally connecting individuals who have something that you want or have some capability or some asset that you want with people who need this asset. So people who want stuff with people who have it. And like, you know, this is just a snapshot of a whole bunch of industry verticals that are starting to be changed, that are starting to see sort of a mainstream use of this form of collaborative consumption. So I spend a lot of time with these sharing economy companies. Um, this is me visiting Lyft last year, trying to be a Lyft car. And I didn't fool anybody, didn't get any rides. Like, you know, there's some things that digital technology can't do. But there are two questions that I've been interested in. One is, how big is this phenomenon? And two is, why now? The idea of sharing has been around for a long time. Why is it happening now? So I don't expect to have a good answer to the first question for a while. And that's because I think there are sociological and cultural changes in how we consume that are playing out and will play out over the next two or three years that will affect the economic numbers. So I don't believe any of the numbers I see. But here are some indicators. There are 80 million power drills in the United States. Each of those power drills gets used on average 13 minutes in its lifetime. Last night, over 150,000 people stayed at an Airbnb. That puts them in the league of the big hotel chains. If you look at the number of listings, this is the number of people who actually stayed. If you look at the number of listings, you know, they're comparable to the largest hotel chains in the world. Over four and a half million people have contributed to a Kickstarter. 
more than a million of them twice. They have made over 10 million contributions. In its lifetime, a car gets used on average 8% of the time. 92% of the time is just sort of sitting there doing nothing. And finally, the last number, that's the number that they tell me that Uber will raise its next round of financing at a valuation of. Um, these are my friends in the Valley. This is gonna close soon. So just to give you a sense for a company that's less than four years old, that's the valuation that they are raising their hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, so the second question was what's changed? And here's what's changed. I sketched this out on my whiteboard upstairs. You can come and visit it if you want. I see three things that have changed in the last few years. One is that we have gotten comfortable transacting through our digital interfaces. We've been buying stuff online for more than a decade, and we're used to the idea that someone on the other end of the internet has something of value that they're willing to share with us because we've been using file sharing networks for over a decade. So there's this comfort, that's one reason. A second reason has to do with a trend that has been playing out over the last decade called the consumerization of digital. So in the 80s and 90s, technological progress and development in the tech companies was driven by the needs of business. PCs, spreadsheets, word processing software, sort of you know, ERP. About 10 years ago, we saw a shift where the focus shifted to consumers, where now the big technologies are being developed not for business and adapted to consumers, but are being developed for consumers and then adapted to business. So this is a trend that is fueling us having really powerful devices that are networked. And the final thing that has changed is that we have created this infrastructure of trust that is digital and upon which we can layer a bunch of platforms. These are not just the reviews that we write for each other on eBay or on Airbnb. But if you think about it, what Facebook has done is that it's taken all of the real world social capital that we have and it's digitized it and made it available for people to sort of use so that you can you know, use this to sort of trust just a little more that semi-anonymous peer who you might be transacting with. When I was a graduate student, re-engineering was all the rage. And in 1990, Michael Hammer wrote an article, one of the most influential HBR articles there's been. And he pointed out that with the advent of PCs, client-server technology, and Ethernet, companies could now fundamentally rethink production. They could rip out their old ways, assembly line ways of doing work, and reorganize work completely. What I think we're on the verge of here is a re-engineering of consumption. We now have those powerful networked computing devices in our pockets, our smartphones. We have social media, and we have these platforms that we can access. And so we can fundamentally start to rethink the way we consume. It's almost like what Paul Graham said on tax day this year. Maybe ownership was just a hack. It's sort of an inefficient way of consuming. Why do you have to own something in order to consume it? Maybe sharing is the future. We just haven't had the technology yet. And as people share more and more, as people, rather than working for large corporations, start to sort of like, you know, become suppliers to these sharing economy platforms, we might see sort of like a fundamental reinvention of work. So in a decade, you may not be working for one company for 12 hours a day, five days a week. You might be a supplier of extremely valuable skills and assets on a variety of different platforms and have a much happier life. <laughs> I'm not gonna have time to go into what should the incumbents do. There is some regulatory challenge that these platforms are facing. The new business models aren't fitting into the old boxes. This is sort of one front on which the incumbents are sort of dealing with like you know, these new business models. I am heartened though to note that there is a recognition that fundamentally, this isn't just a bunch of new business models. There is a tremendous amount of consumer support and consumer value being created by the sharing economy. And what organizations like Peers, which is a new collective that is trying to sort of gather together consumers who participate in the sharing economy and make their voice heard in the regulatory debate, it's heartening to see that this really important component of what should our regulations be, how should our cities be run, is not just being duked out between the tech companies and the incumbents and the government officials. That sort of a consumer collective enabled by an internet platform is also going to be a big part of the conversation.
I was at the US Conference of Mayors in June in Vegas, 250 mayors, me, and actually 300,000 people were there for a rave as well. It was like, you know, quite a, it was quite, quite a gathering. The highlight and why I was there was for a session that sponsored the Shareable Cities Initiative. 15 mayors from major cities around the country have said that they are going to sort of work towards altering city regulatory policy towards making their cities more shareable. And if you think about the backdrop of what you heard about this morning, about innovation in cities, you can build more asset-efficient cities if you use sharing economy principles, because you can get more consumption out of fewer assets. So this is important not just for US cities, but particularly for cities in developing countries and cities in other parts of the world. My final thought was of a cautionary note. As we start to participate in these marketplaces more actively and build these reputations, and these reputations then become the gateway to what we can consume, like your credit score in the ownership economy, then we risk sort of a form of what Om Malik from Giga Om calls data Darwinism. You might sort of split society into the people with good reputations and the people with not so good reputations. So this is something to watch out for. There's a lot more that I'd love to share with you about the sharing economy. I'm out of my very flexible nine minutes. And uh, <laughs> so here's where you can find me. Thank you. Thanks, Professor.